Hello, good evening, everybody. Uh, and welcome to the Community Stakeholder Forum. Um, for anyone that wasn't here on the panel um, last week, um, welcome. We would, we would like it very much if you wouldn't mind introducing yourselves um, with maybe one sentence. Um, I'm just going to think where to start here. So perhaps Martin, would you mind introducing yourself? Yeah, sure, no problem. I'm Martin Solder. I'm the uh, chief exec at the Essex Boys and Girls Clubs and uh, we have a long history of setting up youth groups in, in Oxford. Thank you very much. Edward? Um, yeah, just um, a kind of green environmental activist around these parts. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Janet? Yes, I chair a local strategic partnership subgroup that covers employment, economy, skills, environment and transport. Thank you, Janet. Richard? Uh, yes, I'm the local representative for CPRE, uh, but I have a background um, in development, um, not doing it, usually advising on it. And um, I was also a principal author of the Thaxted Neighbourhood Plan. So I have some understanding of planning. Thank you very much. And finally, I think Alistair. Oh, you're on mute, Alistair. Alistair, you're on mute. Yeah, got that now. <laughs> okay, so I'll start again. Um, so I'm Alistair Pollock. I uh, coordinate the work of the Essex Developers Group, which is a partnership between uh, all 14 Essex local authorities and the the house builders, uh, those that are on our kind of partnership. And yeah, we're, we're just, the aim is to further uh, housing development in a sustainable way in Essex. Um, and we've got a website where everything is kind of there, which is called Housing Essex. Um, if you go to that Google Housing Essex, you should come up with the website. Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, this is our panel on the um, Community Stakeholder Forum. Um, I'm Andrew Dixon, I'm, I'm the uh, independent chair, um, but also this, this meeting is being conducted in a webinar format. So there are a number of people um, who are watching us in listen only mode. So for those people, just a few um, housekeeping notes. So you have no video or no hand raising functions. In other words, you can see us, but we, we can't see you. Um, there is no chat function enabled for the people watching um, on the webinar, but we will um, be using the Q&A function um, and uh, you will have the opportunity to ask questions of the forum and those questions can be upvoted. And on item five of our agenda, the three most popular questions um, will be put um, to the panel. Um, okay, so hopefully technically, um, we're all set. So it's um, a huge pleasure um, this evening uh, to welcome our speaker to speak on our theme of where you live. And we have with, with us um, Dr. Uh, Noha Nasser, um, who is going to give us the presentation now. Thank you very much, Dr. Nasser. Thank you, Angela. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here with you. Um, I, I do have a presentation and I will start sharing the screen quite soon, but I just wanted to um, say a few words about this evening. So uh, I would like to have opportunities to have conversations with you throughout the presentation. So I'll be coming in and out of uh, presentation mode. Um, to have an opportunity to speak, uh, I'd love to hear from all of you if possible. Um, of course, uh, you can speak on your own behalf, because this is about where you live, but also maybe to consider the people you're also representing. So uh, that might be something to bring to the table. Um, the focus of today is to understand what you value about where you live and how would you like to see it evolve in the future? Um, I'm going to put forward a couple of ideas and it would be great to discuss them um, as and when. So I think uh, maybe a short introduction about myself. Um, 
I am an architect, urban designer. Um, I'm also, I've been an academic for a lot, a lot of my career, but uh, about five years ago, I set up my own practice, which is a social enterprise called Mella. Uh, Mella's mission is to curate and design inclusive public spaces. I'm very interested in the idea of bridging cultures. In fact, I wrote a book about it, um, a guide to social innovation in cosmopolitan cities. Um, I've held a number of um, academic um, sort of directorships, uh, the Masters in Urban Design at Birmingham School of Architecture, and I've since then worked in quite a few universities. Um, and also I co-chair the Association of Collaborative Design, which essentially means that um, there's no better way to design a place than with the people who live there, because they are the experts in their places. So I'm really happy that um, this particular local plan is being co-designed, uh, in fact, with all of you and, uh, and your constituents. So uh, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to be part of this. Right, so um, without further ado, I'll, I'll, I'll share my screen. This is the first um, test. Let's see how we do. Um, right, okay. Uh, let's see. I am um, hoping that there is uh, no issue with the screen right now. Could someone say if there is? Can you see the presentation? Yes, we have a thumbs up. Um, maybe what I'll do is minimize you all. Sorry about that. Um, but I will, I will see you again shortly. <laughs> So as I said, we're, we're here today to talk about where you live, um, which is a very personal um, matter. It is obviously something that um, we experience every day. Um, it's where we create um, meaning in our lives. It's also where we build relationships with our neighbors and with our communities. So where you live actually is a very important starting point um, for thinking about this local plan. Okay. So I wanted to start by a little bit of a review of some of the things we're going to be contending with if we haven't started already um, in terms of developing and, and, and building new places. So um, these are demographic trends that I think are going to impact all of us. Uh, and we've already begun to see some of them. So the first trend is that we have an aging population. We're living longer. And here are some interesting statistics that I wanted to share with you. 20% of people in England will be over 65 by 2030. 3.2 million people in the UK will be over 85 by 2041, double today's number, and one in five chance of 20 year olds living today reaching the age of 100. But what does this mean? And I think uh, this indicator on the far right is actually quite important that in fact, the number of, because we've got larger numbers of old, aging uh, people, we also will be contending with the issue of dementia which will double in the next 40 years from 800,000 in 2012 to 1,700,000 in 2051. That's a considerable um, increase. And of course that will have to have an, that will also have an impact on how we design places for aging populations. A second trend um, is the idea that the UK um, is getting increasingly more diverse. And we can see here proportionally that by 2040, we have an increase in the number of ethnic minorities. Um, again, why is that important? Well, um, maybe Uttlesford is not as diverse as other parts of the country, but there may be, um, as places develop, people moving into the area and what we've seen uh, with a lot of the work that I've been doing is that ethnic diversity can also lead to segregation, which is not what we want in placemaking. So these are, again, another factor just to keep in mind. 
Um, a third trend is the idea that we're living longer alone, um, which means we have larger numbers of single households. What's particularly interesting, as you can see in this graph, is that the age, you've got the ages here, 25 to 34 and 85 plus. And then you have these two years, the darker purple is 2008 and the lighter mauve is 2033. And over all the age groups, we have more single households um, across the board. So again, um, it'll affect the kinds of houses that we're going to be thinking about building, the kinds of places that we need to accommodate more people living um, alone. And the fourth trend is something quite emotive, um, and that is that we have uh, an incredible amount of loneliness and social isolation that are impacting our lives. So there's a real need for creating places that support social interaction. Uh, again, this infographic is quite interesting. I'll pick a few. Um, a quarter of Brits know a parent who's lonely. 13% of us feel lonely all the time. And 1 million people aged 65 plus always or often feel lonely. So loneliness is a real issue and something I think is important um, to think about in, um, in the future. So we have the evidence and the planning guidance um, as well. But unfortunately, what do we continue to build and for whom? And this is a very common um, development that we see cropping up almost everywhere in the country. Um, and here are just a, a few indicators, um, primarily that these types of places are designed for the car, either where we park it, as we can see here, for our guests or our driveway, or we design high speed roads that cr create um, this feeling that the car is more important than the pedestrian. And then when we look at the places for human life, we actually have narrow pavements, no place for children to play. And the distance between houses isn't intimate and doesn't encourage social interaction. So we're building places that aren't really supporting some of the trends we're seeing. Um, people with dementia, um, aging populations, um, families in larger households, particularly those from ethnic minorities, uh, loneliness, places for social interaction, intergenerational spaces. All of these spaces don't seem to be um, always put as a priority. And of course, this issue of segregation continues to be an issue, not just in terms of ethnic diversity, as we can see here on the left, you can see how many households from different ethnic backgrounds are homeowners. Um, and you can see, generally speaking, um, the Indian community has higher home ownership, as does mixed white Asian, as does white British. Um, and similarly, socioeconomically, um, you, you can see that home ownership is greatest with those with the highest incomes, which is understandable, but even um, less so with those from ethnic uh, minorities. So we have a real discrepancy, and, and this is causing huge divisions within society, um, lack of social cohesion, and ultimately people um, not relating to each other. In Uttlesford, there will be um, other data that you can um, find to support some of the issues where we've been talking about. But here's just a few things about Uttlesford that, um, that I know of. So as we can see from the population uh, diagram here, you, you've got large numbers of families, um, large numbers of you might call middle-aged people, and relatively large numbers of people over retirement age. So um, what seems to be less so are those in the early career bracket. Um, 
So there may be issues around jobs for early career people um, where they go elsewhere. Um, house prices and average incomes. So house prices are quite buoyant. Again, you know, affordability might be an issue um, and that's really dependent on income levels and, and the prices. So there may be other issues around affordability that need to be taken account of. Also, whether we're building um, places that can accommodate the demographic of Uttlesford. These are all things that um, I'm sure you will be covering in the weeks to come. So we're going to now move um, on to the topic of Uttlesford um, itself and your neighborhoods. So specifically about where you live. And I want to start by um, a, uh, a video about the 15 minute neighborhood or the 15 minute city. This is a concept that is currently in vogue. Um, and what I'd like to do is to share it with you and then to begin to think about Uttlesford and, and applying some of the ideas in this concept to um, your daily life. So Before the recent lockdowns around the world, we led hectic lives with long commutes and not enough time to spend with our families and friends. Traffic polluted our air and smog blanketed our skylines. What if it could be different? What if we could create a new normal where we reclaim our time, our health and well-being, and our communities? This is the idea behind the 15-minute city, a growing movement to make our lives in cities more convenient, less stressful, and more sustainable. A 15-minute city is one where everything we need is close to home, where communities are safe and inclusive, where the air is clean, a 15-minute city is one where it's easy to get goods and services. Fresh groceries, health care, and other amenities are all just a short trip away. A 15-minute city is one where everyone has a place. A 15-minute city has affordable, accessible, and adaptable housing for households of all sizes and ages. A 15-minute city means that you can work close to home or work remotely more often. And we all play a role in our neighborhood. What if we don't go back to life as it was? What if we already have the power to change how we live? Together, we can reimagine and create the future we want. One that is cleaner, safer, healthier, and more inclusive. And gives us back valuable time to enjoy the little things. Thank you. Thank you, Hayley. Oh, okay. Well, um, thank you. So uh, there is there is a slide um, which I'll just present. Uh, just a minute, sorry. Which is this one? Uh, let me share my screen with you. Which is our discussion for today? Uh, for now. Um, so this actually is um, a circle which I used as part of a, an engagement strategy talking about the um, things that are important. So your home is in the middle and then you have these concentric circles. One is on foot, another one is um, in your car, although we don't want to encourage that one on the bus and one on a bike. And then you begin to think about all those things that you need within a 15 minute bus ride or a 15 minute cycle or a 15 minute walk. So um, I wanted to start our conversation today by asking you, what does your 15 minute neighborhood have which you value? What does your 15 minute neighborhood have which you value? So I'm going to now exit so I can see you all.
and I would welcome every person to tell me what it is. Um, I, as there's so many of you, I hope you don't mind if I call on you. Um, so let's see now. Um, Richard, you're top of the list here after Haley, which I know is hosting us. Richard, what do you value? Um, Please well, don't forget I'm to unmute yourselves when you speak. <laughs> uh, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, right, jolly good. Um, I am unmuted. Yes, I can. Um, um, yes, I mean, I'm talking specifically about Thaxted, which is perhaps uh, certainly not unique in Uttlesford, but it is, it is a rather uh, strange place in many ways. It is actually remarkably remote. So I'm not too sure about this 15 minute theory. I don't think there's going to be too much that actually applies. But um, I mean, we are something like six miles to the nearest A road, and we're six miles to the nearest station, which is Elsnam. We're 20 miles to the nearest hospital. So um, we are remote, but it is that remoteness that actually makes us very special. Um, it has preserved our heritage, it's preserved our landscape. And uh, I mean, mistakes have been made recently. Uh, we've had 200 new houses in the last five years. And some of that development has just not been sustainable, frankly. Uh, but as a community, it works very well. It, uh, it has its own doctor's surgery. Uh, it has a very good primary school. It has all the sort of clubs and societies that you could hope for. So within its context and of its size, uh, it is, um, albeit in a sort of a, a minuscule way, it is a 15 minute community but if you want to go for the bigger things, it's a, a carborn community. Or hopefully a bus. No bus? Any any? Uh, yes, there are buses, but strangely, no one seems to use them. Everyone takes the car. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> and uh, in your 15 minute uh, village, Richard, what do you value the most? Of all of those, uh, that, those bits of social infrastructure you mentioned? Of the social, the bits of social infrastructure, I mean, I think it is nice to have a surgery within the village. Um, primary school is not relevant to someone of my age, mm -hmm. but um, there are, I mean, there, there, there is a very good community <laughs> spirit. <laughs> I, it, in, doing, in doing the neighbourhood plan, um, there was tremendous enthusiasm for that. Everyone wanted to, to, to say their piece. And I think we had something like a 96% mm. approval of the neighbourhood plan. So the, it is a very good community spirit. I think that's probably that's what awesome. I value the most. But then obviously the physical factors, the, okay. the heritage of Thaxted is, is, is very, very significant. Fantastic, thank you. Um, great, well, it sounds like you've got a lot um, already planned for in your neighbourhood plan. Thank you, Richard. Um, so uh, let's see, Anthony. Anthony, um, you're next on the yes. on the list. Well, Where's I, Anthony? You know, I live in the Hello. City. I live in the 15 minute city. Um, uh huh. Turn left out of um, my uh, house, and within two minutes, I'm in the high street. I can turn right out of my house, um, and passing Fairycroft House, I go down Fairycroft Road into the uh, eastern part of town. I um, Everything I need is in the town. Um, we hardly ever use a car. Perhaps my wife uses it to, um, to go to various events outside the town, but that's another matter. I hardly drive at all these mm -hmm. days. I've been retired for 10 years. Mm -hmm. uh, no, I've got everything I want. Thank you very much. Oh, particularly Saffron Hall. Fantastic. Up the road. Saffron Hall. <laughs> Do you? Is that what you value the most? Oh, Saffron Hall. Okay, great. I, I think that's a yes. Um, fantastic. So, thank you for that, Anthony. Um, right then, we have Edward. Yeah. Well, I am unbelievably lucky. I mean, I am the best placed guy in town. I can walk. I walk across the common to the shops and I have my trusty bags and rucksack and I get everything I want from our local independent shops and the market, the market stallholders, 
And that is brilliant. So I love the market. I love the common. I love the events that happen on the market and on the common, the independent retailers that I hope will survive. Uh, Saffron Hall is brilliant. Um, and, um, uh, and I you know, love the architecture is, is gorgeous everywhere I go. So I am unbelievably lucky, mm. but, but I know a lot of people aren't in that privileged position really. Um, and I, I cycle yeah. to the station. So I can, I can get to the station by bike in about 12 minutes. But, you know, as the years go by, I Fantastic. might not be able to make that. But, but I, if I want to go to London, I cycle to the yeah. station. And that's just about manageable. But it's not ideal to have a station two miles out of town. Fantastic. Thank you, Edward. Um, I mean, clearly, uh, the common as a public green space is a very important center of community life um, but I think you also mentioned the independent shops it's nice yeah. to have something that's very specific to a place great thank you Alistair uh, Alistair hello Oops. yes I think I've uh, unmuted I'm, myself I'm, now yeah. okay hi Alistair okay hello there um, yes. so first of all um, I don't live locally in, uh, I don't actually live in Essex so um, that's why I'm kind of standing in for our chair Mark Curl who does actually live in Essex um, we might be coming to future meetings but um, from my perspective I mean I live in a, a village in Kent so um, I think the important thing is probably most re are relevant here relevant in Essex I'm sure but I would say I've got three things one is um, amenity so something kind of kind of perfectly on your doorstep where you can go for a walk or you can have some sport or uh, leisure activity that would be my first one. Um, second one would be um, somewhere for community. Um, so that would be a meeting place. Um, so it could be a village hall um, or it could be the good old pub, which I would um, thoroughly support um, when it's open. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so that's sort of for community. And then the third, the final one is for, um, I would say, connectivity and um, in its broad sense. So we're talking about you know, broadband and Wi-Fi, you know, when you're working at home doing these type of uh, meetings but also and of course you know the obvious you know which is you know rail bus connections um cycle connections um and obviously um the car the car is is is, is a dominant factor i mean around where we live uh, live in a small village very near leeds castle um it's quite hilly i mean most of our council have been saying they're going to put in um that you know they're, they're focusing on mo modal shift like everyone is saying you should be, everybody should be getting on their bicycle and going over places but you know the, the roads are not easy to 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 move around they're busy congested um, there's no cycle paths um there's, there's a lot of hills um so you know you've got to be fairly game yeah. to do that so those are my three for for you yeah it's very well structured and I think um, you made the point about the connectivity in terms of Wi-Fi and broadband and increasingly if we are going to be working from home, particularly in times like this with lockdown, you know, the sports place, the uh, open air, green open spaces, those are going to be extremely important um, and hopefully after lockdown the meeting places to support working at home. Um, so we have that balance of exercise and community. Sounds great. Thank you, Alistair. Um, Alison. That'll be me, I think. There's no other Alison. Alison, I can't hear you. Oh. Is that okay now? Yeah, there's no other Alison, I don't think. <laughs> yes, hello. Hi, so my, my, for me personally, my important things would be, are, as someone who works really long hours, um, my important things are somewhere somewhere to get things like food and post office and doctors relatively easily quickly we've got all of those that's great um but they're important yeah. somewhere to uh go for a walk easily again the common really ticks that box as do lots of other places around the outside of the town like if you need to escape for a bit of uh stretch your legs because i actually sit here like 10 hours a day generally <laughs> and um i know i know the feeling uh i love that the primary schools are really nearby so i can stay connected with my grandchildren you know i could do a quick school run or a quick whatever and that that kind of wouldn't work if it wasn't local 
Um, so those are the things that matter to me. Um, as talking for people kind of with their men, in relation to their mental health, which is why I'm kind of here, is um, mm-hmm. probably the same things, really, to be honest. I mean, those, these are the things, the things we're all talking about, the things that maintain, maintain people's mental health somewhere to be outside, connected with nature, um, places where they can connect, they can get to the doctors easily. I think all of the same things that we're talking about are important for people's well-being. They are. They're all good for us. Yeah, yeah absolutely. They're all good for us and our well-being. Yeah, absolutely. I did um, think- thank you. Thank you, Alison. Um, video, yeah, go ahead. It was really great. And I hadn't really thought about it like that before. But that that thing about people being able to talk in their front gardens or on, you know, having more space on the roads and the, the kind of those kind of planning things, they massively impact on people's mental health. And I think it's really important that we really try and embrace that. I think it's really important. I think it's a good point. I think we've already heard from a number of um, speakers that the car seems to be dominant. And uh, if we're going to be continually designing for that as a priority, we're not going to have spaces to interact and enjoy the outdoors and the streets in particular and our front gardens. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, Eleanor. Hi. Um, so when I talked about Hello. this, <laughs> when I talked about this with my working group, one of the things that was really important to them was the um, Fairycroft House. So I think they said those places that are sort of the centre of the community for them, which sort of bring people together. So like Fairycroft House, and I suppose the churches would. What happens that. there? Um, it's a youth centre. Eleanor, what happens in? They do. Ah, oh, youth centre. Okay, great. Mhm. Mhm. Thank you. What else? Sorry, did you say anything else? Yeah, so I, I said the centers, churches. Yeah, so places which bring people together in the town. Great, thank you. Absolutely. And I think for young people in particular, you need to have a big voice in making sure that all the um, pieces of city that you need or, or village you need are, are there. And um, of course, a youth centre, but not just a youth centre, maybe there are other ac- youth activities that you might want to also make sure there are um, available to you within a 15 minute walk or cycle from home. So make sure you um, tell the planners, okay? <laughs> okay, great, thank you. Um, Frank, Frank Woods. Yeah. Um, yeah, Hello. I'm, hi there. I'm, I'm lucky enough to live in Clavering. So it's a small village, um, a bit isolated from the rest of the world, um, geographically, I suppose. Uh, we are very lucky to have a, a good local shop and post office. Um, we've got a primary school, we've got a couple of pubs, um, we've got a couple of community centres, um, sports field, tennis club, bowls club, two things like this. Very active community with sort of interest mm-hmm. groups. Um, which is good. So it, the community spirit, that, that's the reason why I moved here. Community spirit is fantastic, very welcoming, very engaging. What we don't have, uh, medical facilities. Um, mm-hmm. Despite what all the, I'm afraid, uh, housing developers think, we do not have buses. We have school buses and we have an on-demand bus service, which is very, very restricted. So to get to any kind of medical facility, you need a car. Um, cycling along the, the connecting roads, you need to be a good cyclist for that and you don't really want to be a pedestrian because they're quite narrow, they're unlit, uh, no pavements. So that, that's a yeah. bit of an issue. Um, mm. So yeah, car is definitely essential, but, but I think the key to our village personally is community spirit. It's, it's a well-connected village. Yeah, and it sounds like you've got plenty of yeah, you've got plenty of opportunity to, um, to stay connected yes. with other people. Yep. Sounds very good. Thank you, Frank. Um, Janet. Right, I'm again in Saffron Walden, and I would list the shops, our market, the library, GP surgeries, and um, Saffron Screen as the places I can get to very easily on foot 
plus the pubs, but importantly, access to footpaths. So I can be in the countryside very, very quickly. Mm. Um, and allotments. There aren't possibly enough of them. And yeah. those of us who have them are very happy to have them. Um, the other thing I would mention that I think is a real issue is that I'm retired. But I know from talking to people around Saffron Walden, there's a great shortage of business, if you like, employment space and sites. So if people are going to be 15 minutes within somewhere that they want to work, um, that would be quite difficult. And it might be that those jobs might be in the lower pay bands. Um, but again, with working at home, um, there are, I think, the whole way that we work has changed and we need to pay much more attention to it. With a lot of people working at home actually feeling quite lonely. I think that yeah. working at home may have added to that, which you've touched on mm. earlier. Yeah, no, absolutely. It sounds great. Um, you sound very well connected as well. Um, so uh, fabulous, thank you for that. Um, okay, let's see, who's next? Um, John Goddard? Hi. Um, yeah, I live in Saffron Walden, but sort of towards the edge of town. And in terms of the 15 minutes, um, that's an interesting one, because for me, to walk to the centre of town is about 15 minutes. So it's, it's absolutely doable, and I do it most of the time. But it's also the sort of length of time where you start to wonder if the weather's not so good, or if you're carrying something. Um, yeah. Or if you're in a hurry, the car becomes very tempting. Convenient. Even as near to town as 15 minutes walk. I live on the edge of town. Um, the fields behind me are, are some of the fields that are um, highlighted for development. And that sort of sense of it's only 15 minutes, but you know what, that's going to be an awful lot of, I think that's going to be a lot of seven minute car journeys rather than 15 minute walks. But where I am, I'm quite fortunate that I can, so I can walk to my local supermarket, the uh, the new retail development on the edge of town, Aldi, b and that sort of thing. So I can walk up there, fill a couple of bags and walk home. Um, I can walk out into the countryside or at least into agricultural countryside, not necessarily as biodiverse as I might hope, but um, at least, you know, oh, it's, it's beautiful. Uh, it's beautiful, mm. but just as a, as a bird watcher, you notice what's missing from the mm. countryside. Um, yeah. Resources in the town that I value, uh, yes, yeah, Saffron Hall, Saffron Screen, I mean, wow. Um, as a representative of faith communities, we're certainly flush with church, church buildings most of which are well used within the community. When Eleanor talks about young people gathering, I sort of think of normal life for my church with scouts and brownies and guides and boys brigade um, every night of the week. Um, right. if, if my building were taken out of the mix, actually that's quite a hit on, right. um, on youth activity in the town. I am, however, aware that whereas churches are well catered for, we're not exactly flush with gatherings for people of other faith groups. And I am intrigued as to how we promote development that promotes and encourages diversity rather than creates more of the same. Brilliant. Thank you, John. Lots of important points there. Um, I think uh, going back to youth um, facilities, I think it's a balance, isn't it, between the indoor and the outdoor spaces. It's good to know that there are many indoor spaces, but in ensuring they're affordable for young people to be able to come together. Um, but also the outdoor spaces are just as important. So great, thank you for making that point. Um, we do seem to have an issue with the car, though. I think we need a few better bus routes, it seems, by the sounds of things. Um, next is Martin. Yeah, um, well, I, I don't actually live in Upwardswood. I, I live in London, so, uh, so I feel, feel like a little bit of a fraud. But the things that, we, <laughs> that I value the most where I live are the 
the open spaces, you know, and, mm -hmm. uh, and as John just said, we I live close to Hayden Forest and, you know, it's those things, we've got all the usual amenities that you'd have in a city, but those things are the the uh, the bits that are the most important to, to us as a family, um, especially yeah. we moved here when the children were younger mm. because of the open space. So whatever you do, don't lose mm. the open spaces. Open space and access to the countryside, I think, is one of the key messages yes. coming out of this evening. Great, thank you. Um, Matt. Hello. Um, yeah, I, I think I'll keep mine short. I, most of um, what's been said, I agree with, and I won't go through the amenities that I would want, because I think all of them that have been mm -hmm. said, I, I would want, particularly a pub. Um, for me, as a, as a teacher and sort of representing the young people, um, I think affordability is, is one of the key things. Um, I, I am a Cambridge exile. I was born and bred in Cambridge, yet the town in which I was sort of born and bred within is no longer affordable. So I think for the young people, it would for me be a case of they have the opportunity to, to buy or to live in the town within which they grew up. Um, and there, there you have the roots of community because people are invested in the town within which they've lived all their lives. They, they are greater stakeholders in the town within which they've lived all their lives and are probably more inclined to be involved with the community um, in whatever form that takes, if that makes sense. But uh, yeah, yeah that's, those, those are my thoughts. Thank you, Matt. Absolutely, affordability is key, both in terms of um, housing, but also cost of living. Um, brilliant. Uh, Samantha. Um, yes, hello. Um, thank you. Hi. Um, hi. Yes, um, I agree with with uh, what the previous speaker said, and I I would like to add um, affordability. Yes, it's it's a, a really good thing to have, and currently we don't. I think the multiplier here was recently about twenty, so twenty times your salary would buy you the average house here, which is really expensive for, for most people. And increasingly mm. during the pandemic as well, we're seeing people lose their jobs. And one of the facilities that's been highlighted as well that we don't have is transport. We don't have good public transport in uh, where, where I live in Newport part of Bottlesford it's a little village and we have an infrequent bus service so those people losing their jobs now in order to claim their um, universal credit they have to go to a job centre I understand in Braintree which is miles away and you have to get two buses there and it, I'm told it takes something like four hours and 14 pounds to get mm. there and that's person who's trying to claim benefits and people now are really suffering from that so I think we have this, we have a need for facilities and some of them we don't often think about what we need but we need a job center perhaps and maybe that's not the responsibility of Uttlesford to think about that but maybe we do need somebody to think about it uh, and that those disabled people too when you think about having to engage with the benefit system if you have to make those long arduous journeys the people on low incomes and who already have health difficulties that's a real difficulty another mm. thing I've heard that we don't have in our area is um, in, in terms of the COVID pandemic we're seeing across um, our area and we don't really hear about this very often but domestic violence is increasing across mm. our communities for those people that happens to there's a lack of refuges in Ottlesford as I understand mm -hmm. it so how can we plan to help people in that way as well? There's mm. people who have these very human problems which do relate to health and well-being and mental health. Um, and then you have the affordable homes issues for young people, old people, and as you say, um, increasing numbers of single person households. Nobody plans for that in our area. I know what you've said. Um, we tend to get big houses built here. So four mm. and five, three to four to five bedroom houses. Um, tend yeah. to be what we see being built in our, our spaces uh, yeah. and um, as for cycling we don't really have any cycle paths that are near us in Newport and as for open spaces we don't have any parks so we have what uh, we call a common so uh, it's a small it's not like a park really we have a, an increasingly large number of houses in our area and a large number of people our village has increased by about 50 percent in terms of house numbers since 2011 and that's a lot of people so as mm. for open spaces we have a recreation ground and uh, a common but we don't really have 
um, a park that people can use as a mm -hmm. in the sense a country park. We don't have that. And recently we lost um, a really valued pub that had a beautiful garden that was used for events. And we've lost that now. So uh, mm -hmm. that was used for weddings and for concerts. And we don't have that now. That was on our mm -hmm. doorstep. Um, as yeah. for the 15 minute walkability, um, I love that idea and cycling and, and, and driving. But for sustainability, yes, walking, being able to walk somewhere or cycle is brilliant. We can walk to a lot of our facilities in our village because it is a small village. However, because we've expanded and we're quite linear, um, not everything is walkable in 15 minutes. So some oh. people might find that they have to get in the car to get to the primary school. Yes, we have a school and we love it we value the school we, we have a secondary school as well and we value that too but because of the growth in the size of our village we have um, an oversubscribed uh, school system and there's no room really I don't think to expand in the number, number of school places so it will yeah. need um, people getting into their cars we experience um, the school run a, a rush hour with cars um, mm. to, to, to go and get their children or to take their children to school and um, things aren't really necessarily walkable for young children if you're going to take your kids who, and they walk mm. very slowly it's not going to be yeah. feasible you have to use the car the bus service is incredibly hard to engage with some people do mm. use it but it's very expensive um, mm. to get kids to school by bus or even for people to go to, uh, to use the bus and to get to Saffron Warden Right. So we you. think we love about this village. We have our sense of community. We do have a lot of clubs and societies, but there are things that we lack. Um, so um, another one of them to consider is: Do we have the facilities for elderly and disabled people for affordable exercise, whatever they need? I don't. I don't know that we necessarily hear what they need. And young people, we have a youth club. But I don't know if we have all this, the facilities that they would need, and whether mm. we really have the engagement from our young people with what mm. we do the limited yeah. amount of things that we do have um, that's great samantha i mean we will be looking a, a little bit um later about what we could add what we need more of but um i think you've covered quite a comprehensive list i think the planners have, have made notes <laughs> thank you for that <laughs> okay fantastic um simon um Trimnell. yeah hello hi yeah, um, my name's Simon Trimble. I've lived in Sapporo all my life. In fact, uh, I can see the window I was born in from my uh, back garden. Wow. So my, <laughs> my family have lived here for well over 100 years. Yeah. And um, I absolutely love the place. I've got three young children now, and um, I like the common, the place, place a bit more around. Um, the football club is a big thing for me, because uh, before I used to travel into London quite a bit for football, and before yeah. I got married, I used to do it more. Um, the one of the problems there is um, late night bus service from the station mm. because um, if you've got like midweek games, by the time you get back into um, the train station, it's about half past 11, 12 o'clock time, and you can't get to try and get a taxi or a bus um, back into town, that's virtually impossible. Yeah, um, you often have to get one to pick you up or anything because I don't fly it myself, so I have to get somebody to pick me up. Yeah, and um, yeah. one of the things is my son's got um, cerebral palsy and severely disabled, mm -hmm. and uh. One of the worst things we found was there was no school in Sapporo that could take him. So um, I just go to uh, Bentfield Primary School in Stansted. So I used to travel there every day because all the schools in Sapporo weren't adapted enough for Archie to go to. He was just, he's got an electric wheelchair and everything else and pumps and things. And they just couldn't get him in school in Sapporo. And so he goes to uh, Stansted. So apart from the recreation, I love it. Apart from the schools and access for disabled children, that sort of thing. No, I just that. nice to thank you for for mentioning that. I think in making sure um, the facilities are inclusive is is absolutely critical, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Um, thank you, thank you, Simon. Um, um, t Tim, you've got your camera on. I'm not sure about the others. I, I'll need to ask uh, Angela maybe for some guidance on that. Tim, could you go Yes, there? hello everybody. Um, <clears throat> I live in a small village called Clavering, um, which is about seven or eight miles from South of Morden. Um, and I know everyone's spoken a bit about loneliness and all those things, but personally, I love spending time on my own and I love the sort of isolation that I have where I actually live. But you're quite right, it's amazing to have 
once you're sick of being on your own, to have some facilities to actually go to um, that are close. And in my village, it's a small village, we have shop, pubs, fields, village hall, cricket pitch, football, you know, all, all of the usual sort of things. Um, the one thing, obviously, we are lacking is a, a particularly good bus service and also we haven't got a doctor's. We've got a primary school, we haven't got a doctor's. Um, but I spend a lot of time in South Ramalden and obviously owning Fairycroft House. And Eleanor, thank you for your kind comments um, a little while ago. Um, although Eleanor's partially right in the fact that we, we, we have a lot of youth activities, the building used to be a youth centre, but it's now for the whole community. Um, we do a lot of stuff with young people, but we try to get it to be um, almost like a creative youth centre for all ages. And I think, um, without sort of just saying like I'm plugging myself, I'm not at all, is that with the mental health issues that the whole uh, spectrum of people around this area will be um, sort of trying to overcome at times, etc. I think it's very important to keep active and to keep doing things. Um, and what happens at places like Fairycroft House and um, obviously at the church events and Saffron Hall, of course, Angela, all these things are amazing things for such a small town and we really need to keep them and push them and um, encourage people to use things and be aware of what's going on so one of the things that um, no one's really mentioned is sort of continuing adult education um, and things along those lines because we do have as you've shown with your graphs and everything um, earlier um, an older population in this area um, and that's one thing we try and do, and I've worked with Angela on lots of things. And I think all of this sort of spectrum of things are really important um, because I think if you look in the sort of commercial market side, they actually work and we have people coming to these things. So it's obviously what people, some of the things anyway that people need. Um, and, and it's very nice when you have young groups working with older groups because that helps sort of facilitate the community spirit. Um, and realizes that makes people realize that the um, sort of frightening feelings that some older people have of younger people and vice versa, they're really not necessary to be quite so sort of spread out that people can actually come together and realize that we've got an amazing community and we want to build on that um, and sort of enhance what we've got. And I think it's really nice in this area, particularly that different organisations do partnership work together because mm. um, we can really find out what we need, what people like, what they're looking to do more of mm. um, and, and really expand on it. Yeah. Thank you, Tim. Um, I, I think what I got from your share is is the, the intergener intergenerational um, stuff that's so important and the collaborative working, but also events. It sounds like that's something that um, supports and enhances Absolutely. the community spirit. Yeah, absolutely, thank you. Um, well, is there anybody else who hasn't spoken from the stakeholder forum? Just, um, I think, Angela, I think we're okay. Are we good? Everyone's spoken? Okay, fantastic. Well, thank you everyone. Just to draw some themes from what you've said. Um, I mean, it's you, you, there was a lot of kind of repetition, but um, key things were like green open space, recreational, facilities, sports fields, things like that. The common came up um, a lot. We had the market, we had uh, the schools and the doctor surgeries seem to be very important. Um, the idea of adult education, places where people can come together. Um, Saffron Hall seems to have mentioned a lot, so actually doing a great job. <laughs> so there are, um, you know, clubs and, and spaces. Uh, and of course, we can't forget the, the, the pubs as well. So key things, um, as well as independent shops, seem to be kind of the, the things that, that matter to people um, the most. So I'm going to continue sharing my screen to continue the presentation. Um, so if you bear with me, uh, we will continue now. I'm assuming you can see uh, this um, slide. So um, I wanted to introduce the other, uh, another concept, which is what makes a great place. Um, and this is a diagram produced by the Project for Public Spaces, a US-based 
um, organization. And what I like about it is it divides up all the things that we just mentioned into four key um, attributes. So um, the first one is access and linkages. And we've heard quite a lot about the insufficient um, access of to, uh, to public transport. Um, we did talk a little bit about linkages. So difficulties in, um, in the walkability of um, in some areas, um, particularly in remote villages to outlying areas. Um, so, so that's one key thing that is important for a great place. Um, we talked about sociability, so those areas where people come together, um, where it feels welcoming, it feels neighborly. You talked a lot about community spirit. Um, then there was uses and activities. Um, we talked about spaces that keep people active, um, the allotments, so gardening, shopping in the markets, um, sports, all those things that are the glue of communities, the places where it's good for our mental health and well-being, but it's also a great place to meet our, our neighbors. And then comfort and image, we didn't really um, necessarily touch on a lot, except that um, a few of you mentioned the importance of the heritage and that the place is attractive. Um, and I think maybe one person mentioned safety and you know street lights, making sure you can walk and cycle and you feel safe. Um, but I think another thing that we can mention is places to sit. So uh, I'm sure you'll be able to come and visit this again. Um, and in fact, maybe I don't need to really um, dwell on this too much, but some questions for, for you to consider is, could access and linkages in Ottlesford's neighborhoods or villages be improved? Um, I, would, I would guess that you would mostly say yes. Um, could places in Uttlesford's neighborhoods and villages have a better image and greater comfort? So perceptions of safety, cleanliness, availability of places to sit. Um, could the neighborhoods and villages have a better, um, better stewardship or management um, in terms of how they're looked after and who um, puts on a lot of these events and, and programs? Um, and a range of activities. So walking, eating, playing, relaxing, reading, lots of different things that you can do in a place means that more people from different backgrounds can um, enjoy um, these places. And um, could they promote greater sociability, uh, a greater sense of neighborliness, um, community spirit, um, ways in which people can feel comfortable interacting with maybe people that they don't they don't know. So um, also the intergenerational aspect, can we create places that bring different um, age groups together or people from different ethnic backgrounds? So these are kind of all the kinds of questions you might be wanting to consider. Um, so I did want to ask you what would make um, the villages and neighborhoods of Uttlesford great places. Um, now, I know some of you mentioned some things that are missing. Um, in particular, we heard about um, children with disabilities, maybe mothers walking with their children in pushchairs. Um, what else did we hear about? Maybe we can just exit very quickly here and just have some quick sharing. Is there anything else that we feel is missing that would make these villages or neighborhoods even greater? Anyone got anything they want to say to that? Oh, Richard has his hand up. It's only that there doesn't seem to have been that much of an emphasis on employment. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, there is very little employment in Uttlesford generally. Uh, but certainly in Thaxted, it's negligible. Uh, and that is another reason for car use. People have to travel. Um, and I just, um, I, it is something which 
hasn't been discussed at all. And I mean, in your diagrams, it hasn't really featured very much. And I just mm. wonder whether that is something which needs to be looked at in a bit more detail. Interesting point. Um, any ideas what kind of employment? Are we talking office space or co-working spaces? I mean, that, that, that is very difficult because uh, we're in a sort of slightly strange period at the moment when you know, normal rules don't apply. Uh, but I mean, I think generally um, offices, um, anything connected with, with science will go to Cambridge, it'll go to Harlow or it'll go to London. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think it is quite natural that those sources of employment should go to the major centres that are outside of Uttlesford. But I mean, I think there is scope for smaller industry, um, craft type industries um, within the villages even. Um, and that hasn't really been promoted in any way. Um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think there is there is scope for employment, albeit yeah. that it is probably a, a niche sort of employment. Well, it'd be interesting to open that up. Did anyone else got any ideas about employment? Ah, oh, Jan Mid does. And it was just to say that I know that having, you know, talking to officers, there is a shortage generally of what we call business sites and business space. So if someone wants to come to Uttlesford to like, set up their business, it's not easy to find. Um, there are smaller units on farms, you know, old farm buildings that have been converted and some of those are very successful. Um, and there are various p pieces on the railway line like Wendon Zambo, um, Elsnum, where spaces have maybe started to develop, but it's a, it's a large issue. Um, mm. And also the affordability of those spaces, especially for business startups. So I think it's being looked at, and as I understand it, I'm assuming that it will appear somewhere in the local plan um, as, uh, as an issue. Brilliant, thank you, Janet. Anyone else got any comments about employment? Well, uh, Alison does. Alison, did you put your hand up? Uh, you're muted. Oh, yeah. uh, is that a yes or a no? That was uh, not about employment particularly. It was okay. from for the employment. I wanted to make another comment. So please do. Go ahead. Okay, so um, I know someone else mentioned it, I think Samantha mentioned it, but that, that benefits issue, I really should have thought of that myself, just to be honest as well. And I just really want to flag that up again, because having to go to Braintree impacts on all of those people that Samantha mentioned, it's not good for people's mental health having to sit for hours to go and do their benefit things. And we really should be able to crack this. It's been such yeah. a big problem for such a long time for people. Um, mothers with push chairs, you know, just all sorts of people have to get to brain tree on public transport. Yeah. Really yeah. not great. Yeah. The other thing for me, I know this is a bit, it feels a bit selfish and actually it's probably not that up the priorities, but it would be really nice as a working age adult to have somewhere to go for a coffee in the evening. It's like at the moment there's like you can join clubs and societies or you can go to the pub it would be really nice to have something that's maybe just meet in places they all shut at like the end of the shopping day it's just something okay so is that like a cafe or a restaurant or a bar you know if i wasn't working so people that i know that don't work go to starbucks or costa or whatever but by the time i'm free they're shut and it would mm. actually be really nice to be able to meet up with people yeah it's probably not a okay. massive priority, but it would help. No, it's, a, it's, a, it's an important meeting place. Absolutely. Thank yeah. you. Thank you for saying that. Yeah. Anybody else? Anthony, I can see you. Yeah. Oh, and Samantha and Edward. Okay, we've got a few. And Tim. Yay. <laughs> so uh, let's start with Anthony. Yes. Um, I've got to bear in mind that uh, Apple School as a district um, has one of the lowest uh, populations per um, square mile or whatever um, of all the areas around London. In fact, it's got a um, population uh, for, uh, only a quarter of the size of the whole of Essex and half the size of the whole of England and Wales. Um, it is an underpopulated area. And um, in the past, it was effectively a farming area. Uh, which has changed over the years because um, it's become a commuters area. Um, and it is that which has really bolstered the communities over the last few years. Um, 
nothing else really. Now that um, possibly commuting is, um, is going to be reduced, there may be a problem. Uh, it's a problem which uh, we may have to anticipate solving here, but at the present moment, I can't see any possibility, um, nor could I in the past have seen any possibility of um, startup um, businesses um, in the area, because if there is a draw within the area, it had to it had to have been in the past. Stands to the airport, which is always looking for um, new employees. Mm -hmm. So, Anthony, the what is it that you think would would be needed? Is is there anything in particular you're saying is needed? Needed is, is a difficult um, situation. <laughs> you're, you're, you're suggesting that um, uh, that um, people are told this is what you've got to do. The fact of the matter is that um, what has happened it has been a natural progression of, mm. um, of people from, uh, out here, from London coming out here. And then yeah. doing it even more now uh, because they suddenly realise that living in London is not what they want to do. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you. Samantha, you had your hand up. Sorry, sorry, um, Dr. Nasser, can I just jump in? Sorry yeah. to, to stop the flow yeah. of the conversation. I just that's wanted okay. to remind um, everybody that's watching um, to use the Q&A function. I think a few people have been trying to ask questions on chat, which isn't enabled, but just a quick reminder that Q&A is enabled and your questions um, should go on there. Thank you, sorry, carry on, Samantha. Um, Angela, who's, who's answering the Q&A? Um, that, those questions, uh, we're going to pose the three most popular questions at the end, and, and depending on what the questions are, uh, some may be for you, Dr. Nasser, some may be for officers, uh, some may be for other okay. people on the panel, so Great. we'll see what the questions are. It's good to know. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, um, you. sorry, who is speaking? Samantha, apologies. Um, yes, thank you. Um, yes, just uh, thank you, Alison, for raising the job centre um, issue again. I think it should be local. It'll be safer during COVID for people to make those journeys if they were shorter, not having to get on different public transport elements um, so often. It will be much safer for them. Um, and uh, a further point I wanted to make was social housing. There really isn't enough of it. It isn't affordable. And um, what we find is that when developers um, do social housing, when they create it, they segregate it, they try to put it into like a little block that overlooks the road, uh, not near the, the nicer um, areas. So we find that's what developers want to do. But we would, I, I, I think you're right, it shouldn't be that people are segregated in terms of um, whatever they're being segregated for, um, poverty or lower incomes or, or whatever, it should be mixed, so that we all get to know each other and that we know that we're all human. It would be great if we, if we could do that. Um, as well we, as that, we have a lot of sheltered houses housing uh, built for elderly people um, or care homes we have a lot of that going on it is so expensive um, in terms of, of, of what they get and, and the value and the resale value is, is quite low you you quite often find if you've got any experience of having an elderly parent when you resell one of those sheltered housing um, items it's you don't always get what you paid for especially if you buy one new so I, I think we should have more um, housing being built that is suitable for our elderly people and discussing our community so bungalows mm -hmm. attractive things within developments that are suitable for people including disabled people there will be i think there's a session just dedicated to housing and um i think what we wanted to focus on today is everything that needs to support housing okay. within your 15, from 15 minutes from your home yes. so okay. um i would urge you to save those notes for <laughs> for the housing <laughs> session Yes, I'd love everyone who needs to, to help with benefits because so many have lost their jobs. And it, yeah. because housing is, is so expensive here, you find yeah. that you can get enough benefit to cover your housing and therefore you're short for everything else. So it would be nice yeah. if we had um, on our doorstep these facilities for people to get their benefits. Also libraries. Right. We, we have in Newport, we, ha we don't have a, a permanent library here for our village. Mm -hmm. we mobile bus once every three weeks which is a brilliant service and so lovely of the council to provide that but I wonder um, if it would be um, better for people if we did have a permanent library like the old yeah. days like the old days <laughs> and, and adult, adult education classes I totally agree to go with it yeah to meet people that would be uh, if we could find if we had learning on our doorstep 
that would be lovely for adults, right. everybody who wanted to learn something different, whether it's exactly. pottery or jewellery making or hat making or something, whatever you mm. wanted to learn. If we had that, that would be fantastic. Thank you, Samantha. Yeah, I, I'm a, a great imagined future. Um, Edward, did you want to go next? Yes, thank you. Um, there seems to me a, one of the, the, the main structural problem facing any planning in South from Walden is the east-west divide. So all the planning, all the development tends to go on the farmland to the, to the, to the east. Um, and is going further and further from where all the facilities are. So they're going, um, you know, further than the 15 minute walking rule um, on, on roads that you wouldn't want to cycle down either. Um, and meanwhile, on the western side, we have the aristocratic parklands. And, um, and I was really feeling quite strongly sympathy for Samantha saying, you know, in Newport, you know, they've lost where the areas where they can walk, but there is a wonderful piece of aristocratic parkland there that no one can walk along. And there are huge orderly estates that no one can walk through. Beautiful, beautiful countryside, beautiful woodland, lovely views. We can't walk through there. Um, and similarly, just on the, the northeast side of, of the town, beautiful woodlands that no one can access. Um, and so meanwhile, people who are put into housing developments on the east side of town have to get in their cars. We have wonderful traffic jams in pre-COVID days, a wonderful traffic jam clogging up our lovely medieval streets and our two medieval um, traffic light systems. Um, and people sit in their cars fuming away for half an hour to get to the train station because all the traveling infrastructure and the sustainable infrastructure of railways is on the aristocratic side of town. So there is this fundamental planning contradiction of which mm -hmm. is creating traffic problems that is denying us access um, and is creating putting housing far from the amenities. And, That's and I don't a very know how good you point. Solve it, but it's huge. Well, we'll leave that to the planners, I think, <laughs> and your input. <laughs> Thank you, Eva. That was very articu well articulated. I think there's a, an imbalance, and, and that's the key thing, isn't it? That if there's going to be new housing, there has to be new amenities. And where there is no access to um, green open space, I believe someone said parks are, are missing in some parts. So maybe a park could be created. So I think it is. It's about balancing these things um, together. Frank, I can see your hand. I think it was Tim next, and then Frank will finish with you because we need to move on before it gets too late. Tim. Hey, thank you. Um, I'd just um, like to address a couple of the points that have been made by previous um, speakers. Um, at Ferrycroft, we have been in negotiations for quite a long time on and off with trying to establish a sort of pop-up job centre at Ferrycroft. So there are things that potentially may not, but potentially may happen in the future because um, I can't remember who, who said it earlier, but I think Alison said something at some point, that it is a horrendous thing for people in this district. And of course, we're not just talking about South Morden, we're talking about you know, the, the whole area that they do have to trundle off to, to Braintree. Um, also, Alison, you were mentioning about a coffee shop. I'm very passionate about if it's not there, let's try and do it. And that's something we're thinking of doing here in the evenings for people because shops do close at five, five six o'clock of having somewhere where people can meet. Um, and the other thing I just wanted, wanted to add that just sort of hearing everyone talking, there's obviously a lot of, sort of South and Walden people here, etc. But some of the, the thing I think about living in a rural area is a lot of people don't necessarily want the office blocks or want this because that's the reason they're here in the first place. So it's quite difficult to just try and work out what's needed, what isn't needed. And, and I do appreciate the problems with that. Um, but one of the things that I have noticed, and certainly with a lot of young people, is a lot of them are doing more creative type education, so film degrees, um, music, etc. There is quite a lack of employment in in this area for the creative industries and they've got to head off into london or whatever and i know people can say well that's sort of them spreading their wings etc but there are a lot more people trying to get um qualified in in this particular area um and i think that's something we need to look at as well because people 
what people do for work is, is, is changing over the years and people are working in very different ways. Um, but I do think it's important we look at like the whole, the whole of the district, um, because I think the needs of the district are quite different than maybe the needs of some of the larger towns in, in the area. Um, yeah, that's obviously a, a lot of problems are people getting to the larger towns to access the things that we're talking about because of the um, poor public transport. So we're back to the age old argument that everyone has to drive. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I think the, the idea of also including creative industry locations, um, certainly I'd, I'd be interested to hear from Eleanor just very quickly um, in terms of future work. Where do you and your friends um, think about, um, you know, where you'll be working, would, what kind of jobs do you think you'll be looking for? Uh, well, I can't say that I really have any idea. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. Uh, I think, yeah, I think you're right that a lot of people are, well, I do music A-level and a lot of people do do music or media and film and art. Um, so yeah, there is definitely a lot of people doing the more creative things. Great. Well, that's something to note for the planners. Thank you, Eleanor. Frank, uh, we'll end with you before we move on just to the last bit of the presentation. Um, okay, yes, thank you very much. I was just going to pick up on what Edward was saying earlier about the, the east-west split, sort of either side of Sutton Ward and Centre. Um, it's the point that new housing development is often actually done in isolation, and it's typically with very little provision of infrastructure or facilities. Um, a horribly good example of that, I'm afraid, is all the little estates that have grown up around uh, Newport. It's it's one small development followed by another, followed by another, followed by another. Um, people there are well aware of the fact that there's no water pressure because each estate is too small to have to bother putting in facilities, for instance, yeah. you know, uh, extra plumbing. Um, but this is at least one advantage of going for a whole community development, uh, yeah. you know, which previously what was in the the local plan, um, setting up some kind of uh, new garden community or whatever word you want to put with it. But it's it's a whole place created with the facilities, with the infrastructure. So it becomes a 15 minute town because that's how it was built. Exactly. That's precisely yeah. what this um, this evening's all about, that we don't want to be building housing estates. We want to be building villages and, and neighbourhoods. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to finish off the presentation very quickly. Um, so let's quickly move on swiftly because I know you want to get on with your evening. Um, so just a, a quick heads up to a um, workshop that I organized for the Ministry of Housing, uh, Communities and Local Government. It was a community visioning event that um, they asked us to bring to the table um, diverse types of households and people from different backgrounds, looking at the changing demographics uh, and trying to capture their ideas about their neighborhood. And we worked at three, three scales, but I'm going to share two with you. One was um, the uh, livable neighborhood and the other one is the livable street. Um, so just a, a quick definition of livability. Um, a place is livable. Um, and, and, and that there's a liv livability is, is like a measure. It's the extent to which a place can satisfy the physical and psychological needs and demands of its residents. So it's the physical and psychological needs. Um, and today we spoke a lot about um, physical um, connectivity, but also the mental health needs of, of a place. So we asked, uh, a couple of questions based on some statements, and then we put forward this proposition. So the first one was, demand for housing has never been higher. Do we want to build housing estates or neighborhoods? Just what Frank was mentioning a minute ago. So of course, the, the, the idea is the livable neighborhood. Um, and these are some of the drawings that were created from what people were saying, let's build a village, not a housing estate. Um, so we wanted to run a poll. This is quite exciting. Um, we're going to try this new piece of software. Um, so you will see these um, come up on the poll and we are asking you, oh, here it is, 
to select three of the most important factors um, in a livable neighborhood from your perspective. Is, it in, is the most important thing to have a sense of community, to have places nearby to meet, exercise, hold groups and activities, um, access to services, sustainable transport, work opportunities, access to nature. Um, you can walk to places, you have recreational facilities, or you can live a healthy lifestyle. So could everyone select their top three most important factors in a livable neighborhood. Um, does anyone need any direction on how to answer this poll? Um, could, could maybe someone explain what people need to do? Or can, has everyone got their, their, their poll popped up somewhere? So select the top three, your most favorite, and then I think, I'd be interested. I think Dr. Nass, everyone should have that on their screen and if they just select. Okay, right. Because yes, I got one pop up. So I'm wondering, uh, how are we going to get the results? <laughs> I'm not clear. <laughs> Has everyone voted their top three? Um, yes. I don't think yes? everyone's um, I believe that um, sorry, who said that? we'll get the results and they'll be able to, to show them, I believe. Is that right? Okay. I'm, I'm hoping, is it Hayley or who's going to show us the results? I think Hayley will once the, she's got them Okay. All. Got everyone's. Fantastic. There you go. Right. Yeah. What have we got here? We have easy access to nature seems to have scored the highest for sure. And then... Um, 47, no, 53% said places to meet and exercise and hold group activities. And then we had access to essential services. Fantastic. Now, what's the, the least is walkability and recreational facilities scored the lowest. Interesting. <laughs> okay so thank you for playing with us um this poll um it's definitely interesting to have tried tried that um tried that out okay so we'll just move on um the second thing was the idea of the livable street um and, and we, the proposition was loneliness and isolation are impacting our lives can we design places that help us stay connected with people and um, the idea of the street was actually quite an interesting one, that now that we're working increasingly from home, the, the, the proximity of these um, supporting services and amenities are going to become increasingly important, uh, not just at the neighborhood or village level, but actually at the level of the street. So we began to think about what kind of activities um, or places would we need to meet on the streets? So besides having safe spaces uh, and cycle routes and outdoor spaces to sit and meet on the pavement, we also began to think about um, possibly having sh a shared garden, uh, a place where you might have the local allotment, uh, a safe place for, pe for children to play. Um, or you might have a facility which had a co-working space, which could also be a place for um, young people um, to do their homework. Uh, maybe a shared kitchen and dining area um, where, you know, the street, the neighbours on the streets could, could get together. This model isn't actually um, completely new in Holland, um, in the cooperative, uh, cooperatives they have over there they tend to have within the block of uh, flats, um, an extra flat, a one bedroom, that has a shared kitchen and dining area and extra sleeping facilities if you've got guests and you can't um, accommodate them. Um, and it's a place where all the neighbors meet up regularly to hold events, poetry nights, um, book reading, that kind of thing. So this idea, if we could maybe adopt it, um, you know, what facilities could we share? For example, 
uh, maybe a crash where uh, while you're working from home, some of your neighbors could be looking after your children or a shared tool shed where you could share your garden tools, just places where you could meet outside of the home while you're, you're working. Um, so we wanted to end with maybe thinking about um, how we can design places uh, in Uppelsford that help us stay connected uh, with people. And already we've heard a few um, examples. So um, I think we'll, we'll, I don't know how we're doing with time, Angela. Maybe we could have a few um, shares um, regarding that last question. How are we doing with time? We haven't got a lot of time because we want okay. to have a couple of questions. Maybe sure. just two comments from two people. If they could keep them brief, that would be great. Right. Anybody got any ideas of how we can stay connected? Can I bring up, bring up one? Anthony? Very simple thing. But uh, very close to where I live, there is uh, properties built about 20 years ago with um, these sort of facilities which are just recommended. And um, I walk past um, this build, these buildings regularly. Um, nobody uses the share garden whatsoever. Nobody at all. Nobody shares their garden? The, the shared garden. Yes. Nobody uses it. It's just, oh. um, just there. Empty. Why do you think that is? Why? I can't say because I'm not part of that community. But um, there we are. Um, was it Janet who mentioned the allotment? That's quite a shared space. Yes, do you want to say something about the allotment, Janet? Well, yes, I mean, the, there's a great sort of um, community spirit on the allotments and we share seeds and everything else. But it's very much for the people who have those allotments who pay an amount every year. Mm. There is one site that's got a community one, but that's not on the site that I'm on. Mm -hmm. So. It would have to be managed differently if you were going to get that sharing to happen. Otherwise, it's a restricted number of people. It's not communal. Yes, good point. I think management is, is a key issue. Great, thank you. Anybody else? One last comment from anyone? Uh, Samantha. Um, yes, I liked that design you had because it looked like the um, open space or the garden was next to the houses and would be no danger to children uh, in terms of crossing the road or anything like that. And I've seen um, designs, this is another comment for the housing session later on down the line, but they quite often have roads around them and then a green pocket garden. Uh, is that what we should be looking for or should we be having what you've just described, which has like no danger to the children, they can actually access that and not be surrounded by cars? in this open space. Yep. I, I like what you've shown us as opposed to what I've seen in other places. Great, thank you. Yes, absolutely. Safe spaces, safe place spaces. Um, and there are actually quite a few developments that maybe um, some of the planners can show you as well about uh, developments where they've designed primarily for play and safe play. Okay, I think um, we'll draw this part of the um, presentation to a close. Um, is there anything else, um, Angela, you wanted to highlight? Well, I think that's been absolutely great. Only, only to thank you, Dr. Nasser, for a really fascinating um, discussion this evening. And that's been very thought provoking. And thank you to all, all the panelists that have commented. It's, it's a really great start to our local plan consultation. Thank you very thank much. You. Some of those things I think will resonate throughout other topics um, throughout this process. And so it's been a really good, a really good start. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, so now um, we're going to um, just move on. We have to have a very couple of quick points um, to cover before we have some questions. So the first one, um, which we'll become familiar with, because it's, it's a process we will, we will come to know and love, which is what happens next. Um, so my understanding is that a consultation document, um, which we panellists have seen as part of our um, pack of papers, uh, will be published on the website uh, for open public consultation. And um, comments should be uh, received by the 9th of December. Um, and these will be summarised by officers and discussed at the forum meeting on the 13th of January. 
So we will basically have the opportunity to discuss the comments from this meeting again on the 13th of January and comments that we've received from the public. Um, comments received after this date, I'm asked to tell you, will still be taken into account by officers, um, but obviously will not be included in the discussion on, uh, not necessarily included in the discussion on the 13th of January. So if the public could make their comments on our consultation document by the 9th of December, that would be appreciated. Um, Angela, yes. I, uh, is this the consultation document? It is, yes, that's the one. <laughs> so if people go to the website under local plan, that, that's, they will find that document there. Um, our next theme um, is going to be character and heritage. Um, and uh, I think um, there's an opportunity here for forum members to suggest whether any specific guests should be invited. Um, we can take, uh, officers can take some suggestions into account um, and uh, they I think they would welcome some suggestions around that. So if anybody uh, on the panel or indeed anybody publicly has um, any suggestions um, for uh, people to join on character and heritage, we'd be very welcome to have those people for our next theme. Um, is there any more, I'm just uh, looking at officers now, is there any more I need to include on process before we move on to questions and answers or is that all good? Great, thank you very much. <laughs> okay, so now we have question and answers and I believe there is the ability um, to upvote questions um, by clicking the, the if, if people look at the questions, um, there is a little thumb on the left hand side under each comment and if we just take 30 seconds to scan through, um, if there are particular questions that um, are, look particularly interesting, please give them a thumbs up and we will then focus on those questions because we only have time for two or three. One by Vic Ranger is quite important because this is one which um, um, he suggests had originally been brought up. Mm -hmm. Yes, I saw that, Anthony. I think that's probably one we'll come to actually. So yes, that's been that's been upvoted. So let's um, let's look at that one. Okay, so I think there's um, a clear, clear some clear winners there. So I will just. Um, Yep. Okay, I'll just go through the, the most popular questions. So from um, the first question is, um, there is much talk from forum members who live in built up areas expressing their need for more amenities. I live in a small rural village and I value the open spaces, the agricultural way of life, the biodiversity that is encouraged, the wildlife birds, the quiet footpaths. Sounds wonderful. Um, are these small rural villages going to be allowed to remain small and rural as many people do not want to live in or on the edge of suburbia? How much value is put on the countryside? Um, I'm not sure who's best to answer that. Joanna, I'm looking at you. <laughs> um, I think um, I think this is a question that, you know, um, we would like people to also contribute to, you know, in the consultation and um, just also sort of picking up the next one as well. We've, we've talked quite a lot about Saffron Walden, but the rural areas are important. So we would really like to, to, to hear from people living from across the district um, in, in, you know, smaller places and, you know, and to discuss, you know, the countryside and, you know, these issues about what they value. So I don't really want to sort of uh, put much forward, but I would really welcome people to, you know, to submit their comments about that in, in the consultation. Great, thank you very much. Did anybody else have any comments? Richard, would you like to say something? Well, about that? It just does actually lead on to one point, which I thought right at the beginning, which is this, um, this forum is very Walden centric. Um, I mean, the, 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 the second and third largest communities in, in Uttlesford, Dunmo and Stansted, aren't represented at all. And indeed, there isn't really any representation from the, the very smallest villages. 
And I do think that is that is a potential problem. And I think that you know the the, the contributor who's just asked the question um, could well feel that um, the emphasis is going to be placed on uh, the needs of Saffron Walden uh, rather than the needs of the other communities. So I just I just throw that out as a as a. As a, as a so I'll attempt to answer and then officers can jump in if I if I mess it up. Um, so basically, this forum has been put together not to represent geographical areas, but to re represent um, interest groups or um, stakeholder groups. So you can see the list there is health and well-being and youth clubs and diversity and climate change, etc. And so really, it's a point to the panel members that that you're, you're representing your, your interest area, um, but also attempting, as difficult as it is, to represent as wide a um, scope as possible in these, in these discussions um, and not just the, the area that you live in. Um, but I'm gonna to turn to officers now if they have more to add about that. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'll, I'll take that. Angela, that, that's exactly right. That's exactly um, the ask that we're putting there. And members were not selected based on their geographical location. Um, that said, it's quite clear from um, you know, the contributions from people and then also from things in the Q&A as well. I think it is quite clear that we are a little imbalanced uh, geographically and that's something we'll be seeking to address with we still have some vacant spots on the forum. Um, and so that's something we officers will be looking at after this meeting, I think, to, to make sure we have slightly more balanced geography. Thanks very much, Luke. Okay, um, so another question that has um, been, so Vic Ranger, um, the 2019 local plan has envisaged three 15 minute communities, but the community in general railed against them. So the question is, where will the new 15 minutes communities be built? <laughs> Well, that, that can't be answered yet. Um, I, what I'd say on that is, so that's um, a, a teaser, I suppose, for our final theme. So once, once we've gone through the various different interrelated themes through this programme, the one we get to at the end is creating new places and communities. Okay. So we won't get to site specifics or anything like that, but we'll start trying to get through to the conversation of, um, yeah, where... where um, in principle, sort of at a high level, people think new development ought to be placed. So um, yeah, we'll get to that by the end, but we'll ease up to it through all the different themes. I don't know if any of my colleagues had anything to add at that point. Can I just add a quick point here? Um, I mean, I think as a planner, can I just say how really interesting it is to listen to the debate that's just taken place? Because um, it's very, very important to think about this from the point of view of quality of life and the sorts of issues that you've raised. Um, but we also really want to listen to the comments that other people make um, in the next, you know, having listened to you as panelists. And I think one of the things in my mind really is around the, the concept of the 15 minute city and how that's applied in a rural area. So when a lot of you were talking about the rural area, I was thinking, well, what does this mean? in terms of what's important for our villages. We have a hundred villages and hamlets within the district. You know, it's a, it's a rural area, clearly. Um, and what does that mean with this concept? So uh, I think for feedback that we get, uh, be really interested to, to pick up people's points about that, uh, as well as all of the other uh, issues that have already been discussed. Thank you, Simon. Um, I just had one last one here I wanted to read out. Um, how can we improve access to health and particularly mental health services, improvements to GP access and dental services? What plans are there to link up with NHS and ensure they provide these services in Uttlesford? I understand there may be a topic later in the consultation that might address this, but this is also an important part of a 15 minute neighbourhood. This, especially mental health services, links with the lack of access to benefit services as impacts on mental health when people find themselves reliant on benefits. So that's come up quite a bit today as well. So um, I don't know if one of the officers can comment on, on essential services such as NHS and how that process works. No. Nope. <laughs> uh, yes, I, I can comment there. Um, 
Um, so uh, currently we have uh, the duty to cooperate, which requires us to um, cooperate with all, all the statutory consultees, including um, the NHS. Uh, so we, we talk with uh, the clinical commissioning groups um, uh, and that's something that, that we will will be doing again for, for this local plan um, to ensure that um, uh, health infrastructure can be provided alongside development. Thank you. And I think, Alison, you can comment on this too. Um, yeah, I was just going to say that, um, so I'm I'm quite involved in the NHS transformation, the primary care, net care network transformation, so I can kind of get involved from that point of view. Um, in Uttlesford, at the moment it's in South Uttlesford rather than North Uttlesford, but the, the, there's a kind of um, a partnership which we're part of as the voluntary sector and as MIND, but also uh, the primary care and secondary care mental health services are all coming together in primary care networks. Um, there will There is one in North Uttlesford, but um, it's further advanced in South Uttlesford. So for example, we've got mental health coaches and whereas at one point they might have all been based in Harlow, there, there's one based in, in Uttlesford now. So I do think that there's a real move um, in the mental health services to move them into the primary care networks. So um, I think that that's going to be much more positive as we move forwards on that. That's kind of already happening. So Great. thank you, Alison. That's really, really helpful. Um, I don't I think that's probably the three questions. So I think we're now moving on to any other business. Is there anything anyone would like to add before we say good evening? And thank you very much. Great. Well, it just remains for me to thank again, Dr. Nasa, so much for joining us this evening. It's been a, a really fascinating evening. I know the officers will have taken away a lot from this discussion. And I look forward to seeing you all again in a few weeks to discuss character and heritage.